thank you so much everyone for joining us here at Farrow and Co for our um, e-week session on estate planning. Um, we're very excited to be hosting another uh, e-week, uh, albeit remotely in current circumstances, which is understandable. Um, the need for care around um, our health, etc., has been um, taxing our brains a lot at work as well as at home. And um, we're really pleased that you could join us in this way. And, and we're very grateful to the team for setting this up. Welcome to clients and colleagues alike. So there's some key uh, intermediaries here as well, which is lovely to have. Um, at Farrah's, our focus is on really looking after our clients. And as many of you know, we look after a number of private businesses, entrepreneurs, family businesses, um, investors, etc. Um, and in our private client team, we concentrate on uh, personal matters, albeit we work with our corporate partners a lot. Um, we do have a microsite, which I think you've probably had to use to join up to the session. Uh, but if not, please do feel free to have a look at that. Uh, one of my colleagues will type the um, uh, address into the toolbar. Uh, but it's www.entrepreneursweek.co.uk. What a great uh, email, uh, what a great website to have. Um, we'd love it if you can join the conversation on uh, social media. Uh, we are on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, our hashtag is EW2020. Um, and if you tag at Farah underscore co on LinkedIn and Twitter, that will catch our attention. Um, do think about our final session of the week, which is a cocktail session, which you may have heard about. An hour of cocktails and not networking from home with a prize for the most imaginative cocktail, I'm told. Um, if you could keep yourselves on mute for the session, that would be great. Um, we are going to be going into a sort of presentation uh, style session. Um, and um, I think that it will be um, certainly possible for you to ask questions. If you want to put some questions into the um, chat, please do. And we'll keep an eye on those uh, when the other is speaking. Uh, but without further ado, I should uh, introduce ourselves. My name is Bryony Coe. For those who don't know me, I'm a, a partner in the private client team at Farrah's, where I've been for 15 years this week. Um, and I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Von Schmidt, who um, has had another anniversary uh, in the last couple of weeks of being at the firm for uh, 25 years so we really are very much embedded in the firm um, and in the private client team we're both partners we work with a number of clients uh, across the whole piece including both domestic and international clients and estate planning is very close to our hearts um, we're going to go through uh, the reasons why you do need to do estate planning. We're going to go through priorities for entrepreneurs and business owners. Sarah's going to concentrate on that side, which is um, making this contextual for you. Um, I'm then going to talk a little bit about the toolkit, what you need to think about, what documents you actually physically need in place, um, and a little bit about the impact of the, of the pandemic, which is not just around health, uh, but about uh, the nation's finances. If there's time, we will um, have a little case study, but if we're ticking over the sort of 35 to 40 minutes mark, which I, you know, we may be, um, the case study will be there for you to have a look at. Uh, and what we'd really like to be able to do is answer some questions and have discussion. Um, the the um, session is being recorded, so um, clients beware. Um, this is going to be uh, something that is recorded. And so if you have questions that you want to ask me or Sarah, or anyone at Farrah's offline, please feel free to save those up. We're more than happy to spend some time um, answering those. So um, just thinking about estate planning, this is something that um, we uh, talk to clients about literally every day. It's absolutely uh, uh, intrinsic to what advice clients need in relation to their businesses, their families, uh, their lives. Um, Everyone needs to do it because if you don't have a will or you don't have a power of attorney, you know, if you've maybe uh, lost capacity or you're having an illness, who's going to look after it for you? Um, in terms of what you put into these documents, we will go over this a little bit and Sarah will talk about the, the, the sort of intrinsic uh, issues for entrepreneurs and business owners. But from my point of view, in the broadest sense, what you want to do is you want to minimise um, disagreement, you want to maximise certainty for people and you need to manage expectations. So again, you need to do this so that there isn't a big family row, so there isn't a huge business disruption uh, in the event of something happening suddenly. And why would you need to do it? Well, you wouldn't not pay for your house insurance. It's as simple as that. This is insurance against the worst happening uh, and it's definitely worth doing. Um, I'm going to pass on to um, Sarah now, who's going to talk about the priorities for entrepreneurs and business owners in particular. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thanks, Bryony. So I thought, I thought I'd start with this quote, which comes from the Global Entrepreneurship Institute, um, particularly picking out the bit in purple 
the fact that entrepreneurs are directly involved in the dynamic and very complex interrelationship between financial management and business strategy. That complexity extends also into the way you need to think about your estate planning. It's a multidis multidisciplinary approach and it's unique to your identity as an entrepreneur where you're exposed to risks as well as potentially and hopefully significant gains. So the estate planning process for an entrepreneur has to recognize the existence of this risk reward spectrum. Everyone's estate planning process evolves over time, depending on, to put it crudely, A, what you've got, B, who you want to have it, and C, in what circumstances. And these things look very different from one decade to the next. As successful entrepreneurs, you'll have spent some time, a lot of time, no doubt, thinking about your mission, your goals and objectives, and your growth strategy. And you'll never stop investing time and energy here. No doubt you'll know what success looks like when you get there as well. Maybe for some of you, it's a fantastic sell of your business and then you're going to do something completely different with your life. Maybe something philanthropic, maybe, maybe something else. Some of you might sell and then found another business that, that may be hardwired in you. Some of you may actually find that your business evolves into a, a family business with a focus on stewardship and collaboration with a, a whole new generation. It can be quite hard to think about that if, you're, if your children are, are very young now, but you know, sometimes these things um, do develop in that way. Basically, every business is different and every family is different too. And all of these things are going to be in a constant state of flux. Businesses succeed or fail. Sadly, marriages succeed or fail. Children are born, sometimes unexpectedly and late in life. You know, who knows that it, it's, there's a lot of dynamism that goes on um, for entrepreneurs. So for you, the process of estate planning um, focuses on two separate but closely entwined branches of your life. One branch is the you as founder and entrepreneur, and the other is you in your personal and family life as a spouse or partner, parent or child. So your estate planning strategy has a symbiotic relationship with your business strategy. And just as right now you're all in different cycles of your entrepreneurial life, you're also in different cycles um, in your family, and this will change in five years time, 10 years time, etc. All of these are factors to bring into the mix a will produced when you're at market stage entry, unmarried and no kids, looks really different from a will produced a number of years down the line when you're looking at that liquidity event approaching over the horizon and you've got a family. Philosophy and values is important as well. Your, um, thanks Kirsty. Um, it's, it's important to think about these things. You, you will already be thinking about them in terms of your business. Um, Undoubtedly, they'll evolve over time. Um, just last week, Chuck Feeney, who's this gentleman that you can see here um, with his mask on, signing some important documents, he's a, um, he gave away a huge amount of wealth. He is a former billionaire who um, was involved in duty-free enterprises, who had the, um, a goal to give away his fortune by his philanthropic foundation while he was still alive to see it. And according to the New York Times, um, this is what them talking about what, how his children felt about this decision. They scoffed at the notion that he gave away a fortune at their expense. It is eccentric, but he sheltered us from people using the money to treat us differently, Leslie Feeney Bailey said. It, it, excuse me, <clears throat> it made us normal people. So that's one end of the spectrum that he, you know, he gave away billions. The other logo on, on here are the five principles of the Mars family, quality, responsibility, mutuality, efficiency, and freedom. If your vision involves evolution to a multi-generational family business, then your estate planning and family governance will include more sophisticated considerations and also family collaboration in developing strategy and values. So the Mars family are, um, they're, they're at, I think the fourth generation or it might even be the fifth generation now. Victoria Mars um, is a director of the business and I thought it was interesting to say um, what she thinks about these things. She says, we work hard as a family to have the best chance of succeeding. 
investing in the family and creating good governance. Then, as the family grows, we can manage the increasing complexity of having more points of view, more interest in the business. We invest in the business and we invest in the family. Of course, you'll be giving careful thought to how to extract value from your business at the right time over the years. So that as well as investing in the business itself, you're able to build up a pot of your personal wealth and to protect your family investment from future business risk. So what estate planning tools are there on the protection side? You may think about using something like discretionary trusts in your will or as part of your lifetime planning. And Brian is gonna come on and talk about this shortly. Trusts can also be useful to provide an, an extra layer of protection if there should be adverse claims. I mentioned the sad fact that marriages do fail. So it could be that one of your children or beneficiaries get divorced or it could be a claim potentially from an estranged family member. So your personal pot, your home, your non-business investments, your cars, your wine, whatever it is that, that you've gathered, um, you need to think about how you're going to deal with that and also how you're going to pass on your business interests as well. As part of this, you need to stress test whether the corporate structure you've got in place allows those transfers to happen in the most effective way. I'm afraid that you also need to consider the really horrible what if questions, which the likes of Bryony and I ask. There, these sort of questions have actually been, unsurprisingly, been popping into people's heads more over the course of 2020, given the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And there's no doubt it's grim for anybody to have to think about these things, not just in terms of your personal assets or things like who'll be the guardian for your children, but also what will happen to the business itself. This is a really important additional dimension. So it's not only the short term, keeping the business operations going, paying the salaries, paying the bills, whilst dealing with the extreme stress of bereavement, but it's also the bigger questions. Can the business keep going without you in that driving seat? Is there enough income to provide for your family? Is it better to sell now? These are the key issues to invest some time considering, no matter how grim, on a regular basis. COVID has brought home the possibility not only of dying from the virus, but potentially also being seriously ill. Bryony mentioned this at the very beginning. You'll be unable to work. And also in the case of being put on a ventilator, which involves being put into an induced coma, you um, would hopefully temporarily lose your mental capacity. So it's important to think about the consequences for the business in a really practical way. Um, whether that's death or whether that's incapacity. There's no doubt that you are a really central person in your business, but who will actually manage in a crisis? You may already have contingency plans in place, in which case, well done. Perhaps you've only thought of these since the pandemic. But as well as having these plans, you need to talk about them, have open conversations with your co-directors or your employees so that you can try to mitigate the risks to the business as much as possible. It may be that changes are needed to be made to your company's mem and arts and a review of your corporate governance will definitely be time well spent. We work really closely with our corporate team colleagues on this area. I just wanted to share with you the cautionary tale of Mr. Price. This is a recent case and some of my colleagues are from the briefing note, um, which is available on our website. So Mr. Price, he was a successful businessman. He did leave a valid will, so he got as far as doing that, and he left the bulk of the shares in his company to his son and daughter. Unfortunately, he was also the sole shareholder and sole director, yet the company's constitution didn't deal with this situation. Although the constitution acknowledged that the deceased shares could pass to his executors, a grant of probate was needed before the shares could be registered in the executors' names and added to the company books. Usually, executors will be appointed as shareholders after the grant of probate is obtained, which can take some time, usually four to eight months. And by the way, things are quite slow at the moment. But until that probate was granted, nothing requiring a shareholder decision could be dealt with. Luckily, there was a way out. The executors applied to court under the Companies Act 2006 and got the register of members amended to include the executors 
the court were happy to do this because if they didn't, it would cause irreparable damage to the company and they wanted to avoid it. So in this case, a solution was found, although with the cost of a court application. It's also worth mentioning that everyone was aligned in this particular case. There wasn't anyone making difficulties behind the scenes, which might have caused further delay and expense. We've learned um, from working with our clients, not just entrepreneurs, everybody in fact, over a number of years, that it's really easy to put this in the too difficult pile. And we do have a lot of sympathy with you on this. And famously, I think lawyers are in a, in a category where a lot of them don't have wills in place either. What we hope one of the main takeaways of today's session will be for you is the importance of carving out some time regularly through your life to consider your estate planning as your family and your businesses evolve, accepting that the two of these go hand in glove. But what we would also say is something is better than nothing. We really do know that you're very busy people and now we all have the additional pressures of dealing with the pandemic with time and even shorter supply. But there are some basic steps that we strongly recommend. Brian is going to come on now to outline some of the main tools in the toolkit. What we'd like to say is, though, is that, of course, it's possible to craft a really beautiful and polished estate plan with detailed letters of wishes, expressions of vision and value encapsulated in a family charter or constitution. And these are great, but they do take time and they, they can be your ultimate aim. But what the something is, is to make a start, particularly bearing in mind these dire sort of what if situations. A good start is the form of a well-drafted, flexible will, which works effectively, unlike the situation for parole Mr. Price. So you need to look at the business constitution as well. The other thing that we think is really important is to think about who to appoint as executors, who between them understand these entwined branches of your lives. They understand the business and they understand the, um, your family and that they can collaborate to achieve your wishes as far as possible. Um, so, Bryony, over to you for the toolkit. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, I think that was a great um, illustration of quite how important it is for entrepreneurs to think about their estate planning to get ahead of the game. Um, I'm going to try and put a bit of a positive spin on this now. I mean, it, it is quite a sort of depressing subject in many ways, and I sometimes feel a little bit like the prophet of doom. But as Sarah has so rightly said, I'm getting a will in place and a power of attorney at the very least is sort of the baseline of what you need to do. Um, I mean, governance in your business is something that I'm sure that all of you think about quite hard. It's a very hot topic. Uh, there's ESG to think about there's all your employees to think about um, there are all sorts of social aspects to what you now do and governance obviously is the G in ESG is is absolutely critical if you're going to achieve um, being a responsible business owner and um, being a responsible business owner also means looking after your family so the will on the whole will direct what should happen from a legal perspective in the event that you die and the lasting power of attorney would direct who would be stepping into your shoes as a shareholder should you die so Sorry, if should you lose capacity um, and so those are the sort of two baseline documents that we um, slightly jokingly say you're not allowed out of the building without um, what we find is that those wills and lasting powers of attorney actually the documents themselves aren't the problem it's who you appoint as executors um, and attorneys as Sarah has so uh, rightly highlighted I always say to clients it's the who not the how we'll sort out the how for you we have lots of options in English law in your wills to have discretionary arrangements to have trusts for surviving spouses where you might have children from an earlier marriage and critically to this you need to choose the right trustees and executors having done that you also I think you need to have letters of wishes and this is not just in relation to your wills and you may have signed a will already and been asked to sign a letter of wishes which looks like a very standard document I don't let clients get away with that it needs to sound like it comes from you it needs to understand or give understanding to your executors and trustees of exactly what you want to happen and ultimately if you think there might be an issue the business might see excerpts from it the court might see excerpts from it, other lawyers might see excerpts from it. So it's very important that it sounds like you is compelling and well thought through. 
We also have letters of wishes routinely now with lasting powers of attorney. And it is also critical that you think about not only the financial circumstances in the event that you um, lose capacity uh, or are, are unable to act on your own behalf in circumstances um, similar to what Sarah has described, but also that you have a welfare lasting power of attorney uh, which appoints somebody when you can't communicate on a medical uh, with a medical team yourself appoints somebody to make decisions for you so that no one's floundering around in the dark doctors are very used to these now and they welcome them massively and so even our younger clients now have welfare lasting powers of attorney in terms of managing risk those three documents together or four documents if you have your welfare LPA should cover the vast majority of that risk uh, in terms of making sure everybody knows what you intended that it's been thought through and your wishes have been communicated another thing to touch on particularly with our clients probably under about 60 and that isn't an age discriminatory comment it's a realistic comment is that life insurance is available usually on a second death basis for couples but also for single people um, to pay inheritance tax on your estate and we would urge you if you already have a will and an LPA and you're feeling very very pleased with yourself to ask yourself whether you have this life insurance and that would be to cover inheritance tax on your non-business assets or any business assets of a property nature which wouldn't attract relief on your death. These life insurance policies can be set up through wealth planners, through uh, many uh, wealth managers, and we're always happy to talk to clients if you're an existing client about arranging that, um, but they do provide peace of mind. Life insurance can also be really helpful if you have young children. Uh, you might want to insure the caregiver parent's life because if something happens to them, uh, then you have a pot of money to enable you to carry on with your business and for you to employ someone to look after your children uh, or to buy yourself a little bit of work-life balance and employ someone in the business. So, you know, if you can have a cash pot uh, in that event, then it's really, really helpful for the family as well as for paying tax. Um, I've put in there record keeping and managing future risk. Um, it's absolutely critical that you keep these things under review. Um, and we do urge on people, um, you know, if you've had a change of heart on your wishes, just send us an email. We can discuss it on email, even if we can't meet in person at the moment. That is all evidence of your wishes and will be helpful. So record keeping includes regular correspondence with your advisors, as well as thinking with your family um, and your business partners about what you want to do to manage future risk. Um, Sarah's touched on lifetime succession planning. That's a whole other session in itself. And maybe next year we'll cover some of that stuff. Um, but it is important to think about lifetime succession planning and what the opportunities are. Um, uh, family charters and constitutions are much bandied about. But as I've just mentioned, getting stuff down on paper, meaningful things that are, are not just put into a dusty drawer is absolutely the most important thing. So that's the toolkit. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about um, the pandemic and the impact there. There are three lovely people on the patio. Uh, it's one of my favourite photos of the pandemic, which illustrates exactly how we are asking clients to currently sign their wills. Uh, and indeed lasting powers of attorney, any trust documents, etc. You've got three people there because a will needs two witnesses um, and everybody has to sort of uh, keep their distance uh, um, and approach the bench as it were, approach the table and um, sign uh, in the right order. So the testator signs first and then the two witnesses. We've had real practical difficulties in taking instructions, particularly from our clients who are either very, very busy uh, or they live somewhere remote uh, or we've not been able to see them in person. Uh, certainly those with um, some health problems have very much wanted to see us in person. Um, I had my first client meeting of lockdown very, very trepidatiously by the, the Albert Memorial in Kensington Gardens because they have very long benches and the client lived walking distance away. And we could sit two metres apart and have that conversation. So we have been tackling those um, difficulties absolutely head on. Um, you may have seen some coverage in the press that we've been very vocal about the need for modernisation of the um, law around how wills are signed. Uh, the government has reacted by putting in place the, the ability to sign wills virtually. Um, but this is only temporary and we think this is riddled with um, potential pitfalls. Um, so we're not opting to do that by choice, but where we need to do it, we need to do it. Um, we are also experiencing long backlogs at the probate registry, at the tax office and at the Court of Protection, and that's in relation to powers of attorney. At the probate registry and HMRC we deal with on probates. Many financial institutions are causing delays as well. So there has been a real impact on our practice, but it has not stopped us taking instructions. It has not stopped us reacting in a way that um, uh, clients might expect. 
um, and there are more couriers pinging around West London with client papers than you can shake a stick at at the moment, to be honest. Um, if we can go on to the next slide, um, the other impact of the pandemic is something that's actually been long, long in the making. And Sarah and I and uh, uh, all the other partners in private client are keeping a very close eye on the social and economic impact of the pandemic. Uh, the government has been consulting on making changes to inheritance tax rules for some time. And this is of particular interest to entrepreneurs who benefit from business property relief with a capital B and a P and an R, uh, which is one of our favorite uh, reliefs, which enables our clients to pass their businesses on in lifetime and on death intact, all the employees in place, all the customers looked after, all the sort of mechanics of the business uninterrupted, uh, which helps keep the wheels of the economy going. And family businesses and entrepreneurs are a huge uh, part of the economy, uh, not least in um, employing people, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So how is the government going to pay for the measures they put in place in relation to the pandemic? Your business may well have benefited from loans, uh, from the furlough scheme and from the general relaxation in relation to tax payment deadlines. But the government's still going to have to pay for this. They do not have a magic money tree, unfortunately, much as Rishi Sunak, I'm sure, would love to have one. There have been long calls for global wealth tax and uh, a global wealth tax and tax hikes. Uh, there's much mistrust of business which is not incorporated in the jurisdiction in which it operates. And so in light of that, these um, consultations are not surprising. Um, CGT, capital, that's capital gains tax, corporation tax and income tax rates are all in the spotlight for the autumn budget. We've still not got a definite date for that, but it's expected in early November. But we're also looking in our team at reform to BPR, to what's called agricultural property relief, to gifts out of income relief, uh, even to the nil rate bans on death. Uh, the sort of the real biggie is the rate of tax. Um, and ironically, that would be the easiest thing for them to change. Um, the APPG has made some quite wide ranging recommendations, albeit it doesn't really have much teeth. It is the all party parliamentary group uh, on tax. Um, there's a box on the right hand side which I'm not going to dwell on but actually that um, really shows that people are thinking quite hard about how our inheritance taxes, state taxes and capital taxes generally work. So that's another impact of the pandemic. The government needs more money, where are they going to get it from and what will make them look good? They might not get that much more money from inheritance tax but it might make them re-electable and that is really important to remember. So we're keeping a really close eye on that. Um, and whilst tax should not wag uh, the dog, the tax tail should not wag the dog, um, it is absolutely critical as, as business owners that you understand the tax regime within which you live, not just on the corporation and income tax side, but on the estate taxes side. Sarah, was there anything you wanted to add to that slide? Because I'm just conscious that you've had spent as much time as I have in relation to these, to these real challenges. Yeah, I, I, I think... We all wish that we had a crystal ball. It's going to be interesting to see um, what happens. Every single jurisdiction in in the in the world, um, well, where tax exists, are uh, will be looking at, and perhaps those that don't actually will be uh, are looking at ways to to pay for the pandemic. So, um, the you know there, there's a lot in the press about what a global wealth tax might look like and, um, and we just really just have to wait and see. You mentioned um, BPR, we've been doing quite a lot of planning with, with people, um, with our clients, um, looking at the what if um, scenario on that front and also um, many discussions have, have been had about um, possible changes to CGT as well. So I think I think that we are, we all know that as well, that inheritance tax is complicated um, and there are some things which are difficult um, to understand, particularly for people who are embedded in it all the time. So um, simplification would be welcome, but let's just wait and see what, what happens on that front. Thanks very much, Sarah. That's, that's really kind. Um, Moving on to sort of a little case study, I think we, we, we've been talking for just about half an hour. So um, I'm inclined to think that we should only talk for another maybe five minutes more. Um, this really is just a sort of typical example of the sorts of clients that come into us and they often come from such sources as private banks or wealth managers, uh, accountants, other lawyers, friends of the clients, 
um, uh, existing clients of our own. Um, and this is really a case study based on something that uh, one of our guests might recognize, which has been highly um, anonymized, um, but is pretty typical of what we would expect to see um, in terms of clients coming in. Uh, clients who might have co-founded a business um, maybe 10, 20 years ago, which is valued at a reasonable amount, but is being um, uh, sort of uh, fattened up for sale in due course when uh, the founders want to retire, maybe in their sort of early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. Um, substantial family homes and rental properties which have been bought from the fruits of their labours, uh, some investments which have built up over the years because they've invested in ISAs and pensions and all that sort of thing. Um, and, um, and then there is the family. So the assets are, make them very comfortably well off, but they're not squillionaires and they need to plan carefully for not only their retirement, but also the future for their children. Uh, I think that there have been such amazing strides made in terms of uh, uh, how children are now identified as, as, as having particular needs. Um, and as many of you know, one of my big, um, my big sort of uh, topics is, is vulner vulnerability in clients. Um, and what we're seeing more and more is clients being very open about the fact their children are facing challenges. And in this particular case, we have the eldest child with some learning difficulties. She's able to go to university. She's got a flat there, which has been bought for her. She's living with two lovely flatmates, but she is vulnerable. So you have to sort of, you have to sort of factor that in. I have another client who um, is of very substantial wealth and his daughter started at university having, um, uh, having suffered from a lifelong, uh, potentially life-threatening um, disease effectively. Um, and when one of her friends at found out who she was, it changed her status there. Um, uh, there is a story told by a very senior member of a banking family that I've heard on a number of occasions about going to a party and someone hearing what her surname was and their attitude changing and, her, and, and basically being flirted with by someone who had thought she was basically the help until that point. So we do think really, really hard about the children, the impact that the wealth will have on the children. Um, and when you're thinking about them losing their parents, which is a little bit doom laden, but possible. And this is why we're writing wills. This is why we're putting lasting powers of attorney in place. We always um, make sure that those sorts of things are thought about. And I'm very grateful actually to the press for once for publicising so well the need for mental health to be taken into account in everybody's lives, whether it's in their employment, their business, in their personal lives or whatever. That has enabled us to open the conversation with our clients. You know, you may have read this, you know, would this impact on your children? What sort of school are they at? Are they, are they doing well? Um, and people are much more open about talking about it. So for all the sort of um, bells and whistles and techie things we can do, one of the most important things is to have that open conversation with our uh, clients about their families. The other thing that often comes up is aged parents, but again, that's another whole session we could do about managing wealth up and down. Um, in terms of where we start with those clients, therefore, it's important that we sit down with them across the table, ideally, but sometimes now, obviously, always now, on Zoom, and we ask them open questions. We ask them, would they mind sharing some information about their family? We make sure we go round the generations, up and down the generations, and ensure that we understand exactly how their lives work before we put in place uh, estate planning documents. Um, so this uh, example looks quite sort of bland in some ways, but it basically sort of, it ticks so many boxes in my brain of questions to ask and um, things to think about. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it, it's not just a sort of, it's not just an essay question, it's people's actual lives. The other thing we look at quite hard now is uh, not only ESG, which I've mentioned, but also full-on philanthropy uh, and the spectrum that exists across uh, being a socially responsible business owner right the way through to having your own foundation. Um, and it is important that clients remember that once they've given their money away, whether it's to their children in trust or whether it's to a foundation, they sort of can't claw it back. The tax rules preclude it. So um, we're always very careful to talk about philanthropic aims and help contextualise them for clients, ensure they've taken proper financial advice about uh, modelling where their money's going to go, what it's for, how much of it they need to keep. Uh, there's no point tax planning yourself out of existence and ending up a pauper if your children then uh, spend the money unwisely. Um, 
And that brings me on to the next thing about what we might do with the clients. Not only would we put in place wills and lasting powers of attorney for them, but the minute their kids hit the age of maybe 18 to 21, we encourage them also to have wills in place. Often those children have got properties in their own names they don't even know about, investments in their own names and even pension funds. So we don't just put the estate planning in place. Um, we also have very few clients of any substantial wealth who have no international aspects. And here, this is an example of what I would call a UK resin Dom family, which I'm sure will um, uh, be what most of you have in your lives, but some of you may have international uh, aspects to what you do. And it has to be said at Farrah's that we've virtually come across no client who doesn't have an international aspect. Um, obviously buying property in Europe now is much more difficult, uh, but many of our clients still have properties there, also in America. Um, and um, so we bring that into account as well. So that just gives you a little bit of flavour to what those words on a page mean to me as a, a, as a sort of estate planner, as it were. Um, Sarah, have you got anything to add to that in terms of the planning process and what you would be talking to these clients around? I think, I think that you've, I think you've covered it. I think that um, one, one uh, while we're being the, the voices of doom, the other thing, conversation which we do have with um individuals but also uh, with them in relation to their families is around prenuptial agreements and 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 thinking about things like that and we're always at the end of the phone if people want to chat to us about um what that looks like um and concerns about protecting their family um but no i think i think that you've covered it i mean that the 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 key word is bespoke and um and we and, and and as we've said all families are different and and the businesses are different and we just need to um check in regularly to make sure that that everything we're doing works i've, I've got a lovely client who sold out his business a long time ago now um was single um didn't think that he would meet anybody he actually is now with a very successful entrepreneur in her own right and um they have a child so all of the estate planning that we put in place which was looking at um mainly his um old older parents and sort of philanthropy has has changed dramatically he's still very keen on philanthropy by the way um but obviously he's got a, a young child now as well so you know everything can change um and that's what makes it really interesting for us and that's why we like to keep an ongoing dialogue going with our with our clients um, thanks for that, Sarah. I think we're sort of on to the question asking stage and I've got a couple of questions here. Um, Alex, you've uh, asked me privately what were the three main planning aims? Minimum disagreement, maximum understanding. The third thing is certainty and managing expectations. Absolutely critical and that comes down to communication. Um, so uh, Jack, you've asked us about AI software transforming the process of drafting wills. Um, a lot of what we do is quite bespoke, but we do use sort of precedents. The other thing we use more and more is sort of financial tools to actually map out what the client's assets are and how they work. We use charts and spreadsheets and accounting tools and all sorts of other things, even when we're just making a will. In terms of actual AI, it would have to be it would have to be tailored so closely to what we do for each individual client. It's quite difficult to see how it would help us. Uh, perfect things but I don't see why it couldn't um, you know uh, help us along the way I haven't really thought about it massively because we we use all these tools already and then we tailor everything for the clients I think in the mass market certainly there's a lot of AI being used now um, so hopefully that is helpful to you uh, Sarah there's a question there about IHT cover I'd agree with you have a separate policy for IHT for sure and a separate trust um sarah can you see the yeah. question yeah no no i can i was i actually was just going to um on there sort of the ai point it isn't it, it's a side point really but um just to say that we've had uh, we've had sort of two live quite relatively recent examples where um people have cobbled together sort of homemade wills using bits and pieces that they've taken either from an old will or somebody else's will and then unfortunately have lost capacity and died unexpectedly and um and it's been very difficult to um to um solve the problem and to, to work out what they actually wanted to happen so um this just it just comes back to the point of 
they are quite complicated documents and it's, it's quite it, it, they can be very simple or they can be quite complicated um, but AI will help um, in the same way that you can go and get a kit from WH Smith which which will which will work you fill in the gaps but um, it's the it's the bespoke um, side of things really that, that we need to do um, I mean, I think the human factor is so important in all this in the sense that where you've got clients who just do a will and they don't look at it for 15 or 20 years, you might as well not have made a will in some of those circumstances. So I think that just constant um, reviewing of it, not constant, but, you know, every every few years review is really important. And that goes back to what Sarah was talking about in terms of your will looking or your wishes looking very different when your children are small, when they're young adults and when they're, you know, you've got grandchildren. Um, so I think AI, yeah, it's, it's probably got something to offer us. We're not quite sure what it is yet. Um, <laughs> I think Ola's has just posted a link to the, um, uh, the importance of wills, uh, article, and there's, uh, a little bit of commentary in there about virtual wills. Um, if anybody wants to ask a question, they are very welcome to, we can get the list up and, um, uh, see if any of you want to put your mics on or put your hands up or put something in the chat. Um, I know James Allen is there. I don't know if he's got anything to say from a banking perspective, but he's very welcome to. Yeah, can I ask a question? Yes, of course, please do. You know, for so for family estates um, that you manage, I mean, Farrah say that they are the biggest uh, estate manager in the UK. That'd be interesting. So you, you must get a lot of uh, cases or disputes of um, uh, where, uh, where wills or managing expectation put in place um can you tell me what the most prevalent are and um what what factors in place to stop that i think what you might call disappointed beneficiaries whose expectations yeah. have not been managed sufficiently and it's not yeah. our job always to manage all those expectations it's very much the testator's job and and the whole um the whole team around them and i think that where we see most success in potential disputes is where everybody's actually got good communication um, and I've worked with families where there is potential for a huge dispute but we flush stuff out and everybody has responsibility for doing that and as trustee and solicitor for that family it's my responsibility to pick up on nuance and flush something out and I think that even where you have very diverse siblings which is classically where a business is inherited by diverse siblings um, who all become adults and have their own families it's making sure that they um, are not all uh, taking pot shots at each other over whether it was fair that you know one of the siblings got the big house and the other one got a load of cash and you know all of mm. that so it comes to back to communication um, I think also I think also it, it can come back to the choice of uh, executor as well because if you fear that there is going to be a uh, a problem down the line it's um it's it's good first of all to pre-warned your executors so that they're not that they're not suddenly left with a, a really a really difficult situation i actually think that sometimes in 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 my experience um with um there are some things that you can talk about and plan in advance and there are some things that you just simply won't know until the um you know that the, the person dies. I'm, I'm dealing with a live matter at the moment where there was concerns that the children from the first marriage um, who had a slightly rocky relationship with their stepmother might cause problems um, when their father died and in fact we, so we, we built all of this into the estate planning and thought very carefully about executors, thought very carefully about letters of wishes and in the event sadly um, my client did die during under lockdown and um, touching wood now, never say never, but, but everything is going okay so it's, it's forearmed is, is forewarned. Um, there are um, rules which in which are set out in statute the inheritance to deal with inheritance act claims and um if if people come to see us and say well, i want to do this well and i absolutely don't want to leave anything to somebody who they are actually financially supporting at that time then we'd need to have a conversation with them about the the risks of of, of doing that um, we have a, a contentious um, estates and, and probate team that we work with um, 
very closely and that can help us identify potential problems that, that, that might be coming down the track later. I think that's a very um, uh, useful topic to talk about and I can see that, that James Allen has prom prompted that. Thanks James. Um, as he knows it's a subject very close to my heart and Sarah's. Um, we've been involved in a long-running case which has now settled. Um, I think the fact that we are now consulting with our contentious colleagues when we're drafting letters of wishes shows just how much things have moved on. When I started in the profession uh, you did a will, that was it. Then I was introduced to letters of wishes sometime around the late 90s as being a sort of jolly good thing that people did on landed estates and shouldn't everybody do it. And we now go into vast amounts of detail often in uh, letters of wishes, particularly for clients with uh, complex, complex business assets. Uh, and possibly, you know, we have, as you say, lots of, lots of landed estate clients, lots of chattels, that sort of thing. And so um, dovetailing what they want to happen with what the law expects of them uh, is quite a challenge sometimes and managing the expectations of those who expect certain things to happen for family or social reasons when actually they've got someone squirreled away who they've been keeping in a flat you know um, uh, with maybe with a child you know, you've mm -hmm. got to make that reasonable financial provision for them because otherwise the whole thing's going to go off like a rocket and we've even had relationships that weren't known to the family that we've had to reveal to clients to say well I'm really sorry but your father had actually what the Daily Mail would call a mistress, you know, another partner and actually had another child. And that's a really, really difficult just, um, uh, conversation to have. But the main thing we do is try and open that conversation with the principal at the time. And, um, and where there's litigation that we can't avoid, we litigate, but we are very, very strong on mediating, uh, negotiating and collaborating with other lawyers who we know very well around the industry uh, to make sure that these um, really very difficult situations for people in their real lives, these aren't theoretical situations, uh, don't go horribly wrong. Um, as I say, we do feel a little about the profit of doom sometimes, but we try, we try and manage everything with a cheerful and positive outlook because actually the vast majority of families is just a question of having that certainty, managing those expectations. And uh, we get wonderful letters from our clients once we've completed some of these projects, once we've completed probate saying, you know, how, how much they appreciate, haven't enjoyed the process, but how much they appreciate uh, the care and attention that's given you know and probate practitioners tend to care about what they're doing at every part of the industry in my experience um so you know you're in good hands once you're there um but this reasonable financial provision thing is really really important and people litigate far more frequently now than they used to and actually nuisance claims are far more prevalent than they used to be which is a real shame uh, but we try and manage it as best we can is, is there is that answering your question enough, or is there something else you'd like us to? Um, yeah, so I, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't want to hog the question, but uh, no, carry on. Come up with some good points. Eh? So, do you want to go through nuisance claim? What is a nuisance claim? Oh, a nuisance claim is my mum's will doesn't say what I thought it was going to say. It's your fault. Oh, uh, I want to see the whole will file, which is called a Larkin Nugus uh, a letter. I want to see the whole will file so that you can prove to me that you gave proper advice. And when you start giving files to disgruntled or disappointed beneficiaries, and you know it, it takes 50 hours of an associate's time to weed the file because the client's been giving instructions over the course of three years, it really becomes quite a nuisance from a business point of view, but also very disruptive for the rest of the family. And that mm. would be a classic example of what someone can do. Uh, mm. The other thing, making claims that they were financially dependent and us having to say, well, no, you weren't, prove it. And just getting into correspondence with people can become very long winded. And sometimes you don't want to shut people down because they are members of a family. They've got to have their say. But on the other hand, if their expectations haven't been managed, it can be really tricky to then turn the tide on them feeling um, hard done by. Really, really mm. hard. So when I say nuisance, it's just things that don't have much basis in law, but morally, you know, they've probably got a point uh, that they haven't been listened to or they've not been told about something or they've misunderstood. So um, as lawyers, we come across many more of those inquiries than we do full on litigation, I would say. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. No, not at all. Does anybody else have anything they want to ask? Uh, very welcome to. You can do a private message if you would rather not everybody didn't see your question. <laughs> right. Can, can, can I ask another question? 
Yeah, go on. Oh, one more. Okay, so so um, uh, you 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 say that uh, uh, lit litigation is happening far more now, as as in America, and we're becoming quite a lit litigating society. So in wills, um, uh, you know, I, I suppose you've answered the question, but just outline again. How do you? What what are the main areas? How you avoid litigation uh, amongst families and in wills? Um, by making sure the will has been signed validly, and that's not to be taken lightly, making sure the witnesses um, are on point and know what they're doing, that they can give an affidavit, particularly where there's a lot of wealth, uh, ensuring that you have very clear instructions, abiding by the law, which basically says the client needs to know what they're disposing of, what it's going to result in, and how it's going to play out. They can't just sort of whimsically say, well, I want to give, you know, my my um, my prize car collection to my um, to my housekeeper um, and without good reason and really just managing the process as closely as possible to make sure the will is valid also managing the process so that the will meets the expectations of potential beneficiaries particularly those who are are specifically disinherited maybe by reason of having very generous lifetime gifts made to them already um, and so just having that whole context around the client enables us to do that and remembering that wealthy people's affairs only become more and more complex understanding how the moving parts work how the business interrelates with the family relationships and how that relates to uh, possibly some of the personal assets you know, we've got lots of clients who are in um, sort of sport so we've got clients with horses and we've got clients who are in music so they've got uh, particular things they want to do they're very creative and just understanding where they're coming from and trying to achieve what they want within the parameters of the law but also in the parameters within the parameters of their particular circumstances so it really is quite with the with the wealthiest and com most complex clients and entrepreneurs fall into this category once they're more mature normally we we do go a little bit chapter and verse on them and just and just ask quite testing questions but we try and make it so that it's not sort of you know we're not, it's not interrogation it's yeah. uh, just having the right information um, so graham, graham has asked a question saying if the deceased was was aware they were being unfair is that enforceable I th graham i think that the, the important thing to say is that we do have testamentary freedom in this country we don't have forced airship like you have in some European countries. So um, the, the Inheritance Act rules the, the, um, in, in statute are there to protect people who at the moment that the deceased dies were being basically financially supported by them basically. Um, but you, a deceased is to leave everything if they wanted to. Sorry, are you covering your microphone? You're cutting out a bit. Oh, sorry. I'm joggling the table. Maybe. Um, I, I you can you can choose to leave your if if you if there's no one um that you're financially supporting, you could choose to leave everything um to charity, just like Chuck Feeney has has done, and um so we do still there, there have been some cases recently where people have sought to challenge that but they were they were very unusual circumstances and um it, it's different if you've got a child that you're supporting or there's somebody who is relying on your support but that doesn't mean that they that if you have three children they should say well it's i did, should get one third of your estate or whatever it is um so um yeah, you, um, you, we do still have this principle of testamentary freedom. I think we've had another question about CGT and planning. It's aimed at you, Sarah. Um, uh, the potential change that has been planning carried out recently, which may be of interest. Well, w what we've been doing with um, some clients, some new, new clients, is where they haven't looked at their estate planning at all and, um, and they're now thinking that they should maybe contemplate doing some lifetime giving to their children. In this case, there's a, um, the, the family business involves land um, and, um, and they, they're just thinking that maybe they ought to do something now with the rates being as they are rather than waiting and then cursing the fact that they didn't think about it. It's, it's not very, it's not especially 
um, complicated planning. It's basically accelerating or kickstarting something they probably should have done a little while ago. Oh, we've had a question about the most damaging change for your clients. Well, I think, I think um, disruption to inheritance tax that isn't well thought through would be absolutely the most dangerous thing that could be done. Um, because inheritance tax has become immensely complex and since I started as a private client lawyer full-time which was not my whole career I, was, I, I did I practiced in family law at the start of my career and I thought oh private client the rules are no and it'll all be fine it's got more and more and more complex since the year sort of 2000 odd when I started practicing purely private client law and um, this started with some really tricksy schemes and so what the government are always trying to do is shut down schemes, but they quite often have unintended consequences. And I think they've moved on from that because schemes are much less prevalent. A scheme is something that's packaged up and sold to someone, usually by, um, not by a lawyer, usually it's sold, sold by some sort of financial services uh, business. And what we're seeing increasingly now is the government sort of crashing around to look good, which I think I mentioned before, so politically and socially, they want to be seen to be holding the rich rich to account um, and often in doing so uh, there, there are unintended consequences so I think the most damaging thing would be for ill thought through reforms to inheritance tax to be brought in from, from a purely financial point of view they could take away BPR increase the rate of IHT and increase the rates of CGT you know, maybe even as high as income tax rates they are historically low at the moment particularly on non-property at 20 percent so 20 percent versus 45 percent that's a huge differential um, and I think we've all read in the press about um, uh, people in private equity being taxed much more harshly you know, there's lots of chipping around the edges going on at particular sectors of society who are seen as bad guys um, and so I just, I fear that something big will happen that hasn't really been thought through because they think they would need to make a big statement and say inheritance tax is now 50%. And, you know, it just disincentivizes our clients who have their own businesses uh, or, or, who, or who have wealth that they want to pass on to future generations, keep the, you know, keep the economy going, uh, going into philanthropy. And it would just be, it would be more damaging than helpful, I think. Um, the inheritance tax rate you know, I hate to say it, it's probably at a rate that we've all lived with for long enough that we can live with it for a little bit longer but any dramatic changes to business property relief as well would be awful. Thank you that's really interesting. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah so what James has just flagged us about the complexity of people's affairs their wills not keeping up with that. Yeah. What we try to do is put a will in place that can sort of cope with that when we know someone's entrepreneurial so we try and put in a will um, that has a trust in it even if they're quite a lot of people don't like the idea of trusts that's very flexible and so that it can morph and so that all you're doing what you're doing is changing your constitutional document your letter of wishes or your family constitution or whatever or your statement of sort of uh, statement of future intent um but yeah i mean the wills quite often don't keep up but critically the mem and arts of their businesses and their partnership agreements they don't keep up either and that actually is a bigger problem for us is the corporate governance documents have not kept up with what needs to happen and there might not be particular clauses we would like to see the memo arts limiting to whom those shares could be transferred on death to ensure that it meets the plan that it goes to you know 20 percent goes to the charity 80 percent goes to the family whether in trust or not you know sometimes memo arts are just pulled off a shelf and then they're tinkered about with from the business point of view and the off-the-shelf stuff just stays in there and it's either silent or it's in inadequate so i would say that's a bigger problem Sarah, you've done lots Agreed. of work with, with, with Memon Arts and that sort of thing. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, I mean, that it, it just comes back to that, though, the, the point of um, it's a really dynamic, you're looking into re two areas of dynamism. One of them is the family as it evolves um, and changes, and the other is the, the, the business itself and, um, and just sort of keep, keeping on top of all of that. And, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we work closely with our, our, corporate, our corporate clients so that we can really understand where the, the stress points are and, and just make sure that there's enough planning in place. We even had a corporate partner sitting with us for three months a couple of years ago, which is absolutely brilliant, so that he could really get under the bonnet of what we do. I think Sarah and I probably talk as much to our 
corporate and commercial partners as we do to our own partners on the private wealth side. So mm -hmm. um, it really is has become a really important part of our practice that we that we can give that holistic advice and that we understand what, what those constitutional documents look like and our commercial colleagues know what know what wills and trusts and that sort of thing do. Um, and they're immensely grateful because it gives them a huge USP in front of their clients to be able to say, well, I can have a 10 minute chat with you about your will and then refer you across. Um, and the other thing I would stress is that, of course, we, we, we deal with people with their businesses in crisis, whether it's divorce or on death or you know, if there's been some business disaster and just pulling that whole team together of like, you need a family lawyer here, you need a reputation management lawyer there, you need a commercial property lawyer in there. We build these multidisciplinary teams within the firm, which are so much fun to work in, but really give the client that real sort of boost of knowing that they've come to a firm that can sort of... Uh, can can cover as many of the bases for them as possible we've also got lots of lovely best friends for things we don't do like medical stuff uh, and financial advice so obviously we work in teams with them as well so it's just a really lovely collaborative way to work um, and again going to alex's point that helps minimize risk so it's all about risk it's all about you know all this transparency that clients have to have now all the sort of compliance and regulatory stuff around their businesses uh, lots of them in financial services lots of them in property it's it's huge this estate planning stuff it's not just signing a will having said that let's go back to what sarah said get a will in place get the right people in place if there's a disaster that they can pick up the pieces go to your advisors they know who they are ideally they'll have met them and the wheels can keep turning and and, and the whole thing doesn't go to pot um i think we've gone over our hour yes Why do we have to stop now i think we yeah. have to. Um, but um there are our details for those of you that uh, would like to keep in touch but obviously if you've got contacts around the firm please don't hesitate to get in touch with them as well uh, do fill in the survey if you get a chance or send us an email by way of feedback we really enjoy talking about this as you can probably imagine this is something that sarah and i both feel passionately about we get much less chance to actually talk together to an audience and we're so grateful to you all for sticking around for the full hour uh, in what is such a busy time and after such big announcements yesterday um, I know that some of our clients couldn't attend because of that, and I'm hoping that they will take advantage of the recording. So um, thank you to them if they are listening uh, later on. Um, and yeah, the door's always open and go, go e week. I mean, this has just been the most fantastic week. It's been really, really good. And, and we're very grateful to the business team for letting us in. <laughs> um, there we thank go. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Thanks we hope so you found it helpful. Thank you.